Today we continue our livestock management CDE webinar series as we discuss beef cattle management with a disciplinary focus on breeding, genetic, and reproductive management. Relative to this particular station of the livestock management CDE, your students should be able to understand and know a little bit about dominance versus recessiveness. They should understand what a phenotype is, the fact that what they see or measure in front of them is dependent upon the genetics of the animal as well as the environment in which they were raised. They should understand a little bit about the heritability of traits, the percentage of phenotypic variation that they see between one animal and another that's actually due to genetics that can be passed on to the next generation. They should understand how to use performance data as well as some genetic evaluations, including actual data and ratios. What do they mean? What do they tell us? Same thing for EPDs, expected progeny differences, and selection indexes. Finally, can they put that into a crossbreeding program and do they understand the benefits of bringing two breeds together for the commercial producer? What should they expect? Relative to dominance and recessiveness, homozygous, basically one animal contains like alleles. Heterozygous, one animal contains different alleles. For example, using a Punnett square with a very simplistic genetics, hair color, black versus red. Black is a dominant color, red is a recessive color. So we can have essentially two phenotypes and three genotypes with the black and red hair color. Black could be homozygous dominant, it could be heterozygous. The red animal is obviously homozygous recessive. Given that simple information, your students ought to be able to say, if we're given these various genotypes and we made them together, what percentage of the offspring would be red? What percentage of the offspring would be black? What percentage would be homozygous black? Same thing, polled versus horns. It's exactly the same thing. The polled trait happens to be dominant. The recessive trait happens to be the presence of horns. I'm sure many of you already know how to use a Punnett square and you probably teach it in your classes. To run through a quick example, let's assume that we've got a heterozygous dam and a heterozygous sire that are both black. Obviously, they get one allele from each of the two uh, individuals. So we might end up with 25% on average would be homozygous black receiving the dominant gene from both sides. 50% of them would also be black, but they would be heterozygous receiving a recessive gene from one parent, a dominant gene from the other parent, and then of course 25% would actually receive the recessive gene from both parents and would actually end up being phenotypically a red animal. Your students ought to be able to do that very simplistically. Now, another example relative to hair color, which happens to be a qualitative trait, would be with shorthorns. Now with shorthorns, we have a red and a white gene. But as many of you know, we oftentimes will get a mixture of red and white, or we may get a roan animal. So how exactly does that happen? How do we get that roan animal? It happens to be the fact that the red and white genes are co-dominant with one another. In other words, if both the red and the white gene happen to be expressed, both, or happen to be present, both will actually be expressed in the animal, resulting in a roan animal. Now, when we originally did this webinar, it was asked, what, what exactly is incomplete dominance? Incomplete dominance would happen to be if an animal had the red gene and the white gene, and those two traits happen to be incompletely dominant with one another, the poor offspring of those parents would actually end up being pink. Neither gene would be completely expressed. It would be an intermediate color of those two genes. That's incomplete dominance. Co-dominance, both are fully expressed, but they're actually intermixed, as what we see in shorthorn cattle. Now, relative to phenotype, phenotype, as I mentioned, is basically genotype or genetics plus environment. And the thing about phenotype is that really all of our selections are based upon that, okay? It's not just how that animal looks, okay? That red Angus heifer there looks pretty nice. It's not just 
how they look. Phenotype is everything that we see and measure. Birth weights are a phenotype. Weaning weights, yearling weights, average daily gain, pregnancy rate, et cetera, et cetera. They're all phenotypes. Yes, we collect data, we collect weights. They're still dependent upon both genetics and environment. Okay, So that brings us to what are the effects of environment? Some of the effects are totally random. We have no idea why things happen. But there are other environmental effects that we know have an effect on the animal and we can adjust accordingly. And hence, basically develop adjusted performance records. A prime example is a 205 day adjusted weaning weight. Okay? To basically calculate a 205 day adjusted weaning weight, and I think your students should be able to do this, we're simply gonna calculate the average daily gain of a particular animal from birth to whenever we weight them for our weaning weight. That would be calculated as their current weight minus birth weight divided by their days of age. That's the average daily gain from birth to weaning. Then we're going to basically adjust that to a 205 day standard. We're gonna take that average daily gain times 205 days and add back in the birth weight. Finally, there's a, one additional adjustment. We're gonna adjust for sex of the calf and age of the dam. These are known environmental effects. The male calves will tend to be a little bit heavier than the female calves. We know that's going to occur. We know that a first calf heifer doesn't produce anywhere near as much milk as a mature dam. Hence, we give the first calf heifer a little bit of an advantage to take into account known environmental effects. This is a, the basic table that we utilize. Male calves, first calf heifers that are only two years of age, we're gonna add 60 pounds. If they were female, we add 54. That adjustment decreases as the dam increases in age, and then for those that are in their prime five to 10 years of age, we don't make any adjustment. Your students should be able to calculate an adjusted 205 day weaning weight and understand why exactly we might do that. Okay. Now, relative to heritability, the percentage of the differences that we see between two animals that are actually genetic and can be passed on from one generation to the next. Reproduction, lowly heritable. There's not a lot of what we see in terms of pregnancy rates, for example, that's actually heritable. It's highly influenced by the environment. We've got to really manage the environment. It's slow making progress in terms of selection strictly for reproduction. Yes, we do it, we have to do it, but the rate of progress is relatively slow because the heritability for those types of traits is slow. In contrast, heritability for carcass traits, ribeye area, marbling, et cetera, is extremely high. We can make very fast progress in terms of changing the carcass merit of an animal through selection because it's highly heritable. Now taking that information, we oftentimes will collect data and let's use it for making some selection decisions. We've oftentimes have got actual data in front of us. Actual data again is based upon, is the phenotype. It's based upon genetics and environment. For growth traits, Let's assume the heritability is 30%. What that basically means for weaning weight, 30% of the differences that you see between two animals is actually due to genetics. Animal one weighed 500 pounds. Animal two weighed 600 pounds. There's a difference of 100 pounds. 30% of that is actually due to genetics. 30, but only half of that gets transmitted to the next generation because the sire will contribute half the genetics, the dam will consider half of the genetics, okay? Heritability, percentage of phenotypic variation that's actually due to genetics. Now in terms of trait ratios, all that's doing is basically ranking everybody uh, from top to bottom using a scale of 100 as being average, okay? It provides a relative ranking. Overall, actual data and trait ratios important for showing performance of the herd. In terms of making genetic decisions, really not a lot of value because it's basically one point in time and it's for one animal only. Hence, 
If we're truly wanting to make genetic selection, I would advise against using strictly actual performance and or ratios. What's a better tool is actually EPDs, expected progeny differences. And for all practicality, they're the best tool we've got currently for genetic improvement. It's a comparative value. And they're typically expressed as either positive or negative values. And the theoretical average for every trait is basically zero. Now, actually, the current average may not be zero because we've made genetic progress over time. But theoretically, it started at zero when they established these EPDs two or three decades ago. In addition, EPDs are always expressed in the unit of measure. For example, weaning weight, pounds of calf, yearling weight, pounds of calf, marbling score. It is actually expressed in units of marbling scores. Fat expressed in inches of fat cover. Okay, so it's expressed in the unit of measure for that particular trait. EPDs are a comparative value. For example, if I use a very simple example, Sire A has a plus 90 yearling weight EPD. Sire B has a plus 65 yearling weight EPD. All we simply do is take the compare, we can take the difference. The difference is 30 pounds, 35 pounds. What that means is the calves of Sire A should weigh 35 pounds heavier on average, key point to know, on average at one year of age than those of Sire B when bred to the same cows and raised under the same environmental conditions. All it is is a comparative value. Also, they're not additive. If the current average carcass weight was 800 pounds and you say, and then you were in year one, you used another sire whose carcass weight EPD was plus 20. Year two, you used a one that was plus 30. Year three, plus 10. Year four, plus 15. How much carcass weight over that four year period have you actually added to your cow herd? When we originally did this, I had some students on the line, I asked them. And what they did is they actually calculated 75 pounds, add them together, right? No. Okay, what you're doing is you're looking at comparative values, you're making differences. If you compare the differences, yes, year one's offspring should have carcasses that weighed 20 pounds heavier than what we started with. Year two, we basically are 10 pounds heavier than we were in year one. Year three, we should actually be 20 pounds lighter than we were in year two. Year four, we added back in another five pounds compared to year three. You do that, all of that, and basically year four is plus 15 compared to what we started with. And we're making the assumption that the sire that we actually used was, had an EPD of zero, okay? So we compared the differences. We added 15 pounds if our original sire had an EPD of zero. True or false, a bull with a negative marbling score EPD is guaranteed to decrease the percentage choice cattle in your herd. Again, with the original webinar, I asked a group of students, they thought negative, it's gonna go down. They answered, yeah, that's true. Well, no, it's not. A negative EPD does not guarantee that we're actually gonna go in a negative direction. It's a comparative value. If the bull you're using right now also is negative, and he might even be more negative than this current bull, you actually would go in a positive direction. You can't guarantee. It's Again, it's comparative to what we already have. Next, we've got a number of selection indexes that are available to us. These are actually, prof most of these are actually profitability indexes. Um, they facilitate multiple trait selection and they, economically weight different traits for a particular category so that people can make selection decisions. For example, the dollar feedlot index for the Angus breed, often abbreviated dollar F, is a combination of average daily gain and feed efficiency. The dollar beef index for that same breed is a combination of what they do in the feedlot segment in terms of how fast they grow and how efficiently they might do that, but also it balances that relative to their carcass merit and what type of premiums or discounts they might receive if sold on a certified CAB grid, certified Angus beef grid. 
It facilitates multiple trait selection and it looks at how much profit the producer could expect. So uh, the last thing before we go into maybe what your students might do, a little bit about the benefits of crossbreeding, at least for the commercial cattle industry. There's two primary benefits. The first is breed complementation. That is simply the matching of strengths and weaknesses of different breeds, okay? Taking an English bred animal and mating them, crossing them with a continental bred animal. For example, Angus and Charlay. Those two breeds happen to be very complementary of one another. From a carcass merit, Angus gives us quality and marbling. Charlay gives us muscle and yield. They're complementary of one another. Additionally, the Charlay, big, heavy, growthy. The Angus, more maternally oriented. They're complementary of one another. Same thing for Angus and Hereford, okay? Angus is a maternally oriented breed. The Hereford, even though it's also an English breed, has always been known for hardiness and doing well out on range condition. You mate those two together and you get that traditional black baldy cow. Been a staple in the beef industry for many, many years. It's a really good female because of the complementary strengths that exist between these two breeds. The other advantage that we see relative to crossbreeding is called heterosis. It's hybrid vigor, okay? This is where we see an increase in productivity of our crossbred progeny that's greater than we expected based upon the parent's average performance. And it's simply a phenomenon that occurs when we bring lots of unlike genes together. Okay. For example, let's take weaning weight. Dam, the dam of breed A had an average weaning weight of 460 pounds. The sire, breed B, had an average weaning weight of 540 pounds. Mathematically, you'd calculate the average would be 500 pounds. And if indeed the offspring are getting half of the genetics from the dam, half of the genetics from the sire, the offspring ought to weigh 500 pounds on average. That's what we'd expect fact of the matter is, they don't. They may be more like 530 pounds or 540 pounds, okay? They're going to weigh more than what we expect quite often, and so we got a heterosis advantage of 30 pounds. That's 30 pounds that just kind of appeared, and we really can't explain it. It's simply the phenomenon that occurs when we bring unlike genes together, and the more unlike the, the dam and the sire, the greater the heterosis advantage that we commonly see. Now, where heterosis is extremely important, it is critical for reproductive traits. We get a big boost for reproductive traits. Way back when, I showed you basically the heritability, making genetic progress through selection. The heritability for reproductive traits is actually low. But when we mate different breeds together, we get a big boost in reproduction, a big boost associated with heterosis. That makes the crossbred female absolutely critical for your commercial cow-calf producer. Okay. Now, how can we use the data and the genetic evaluations, or what are we going to actually do during this particular contest? Obviously, they're going to probably have some basic test questions, uh, similar to what I've already given you in this webinar. We may actually have a group of heifers out there with some data and do a little keep coal type of thing. Uh, that would be very similar to the livestock selection contest that many of them will participate in the next day. More likely, we may actually have a sire summary quiz where we basically give them a set of data for a set of four bulls, four more bulls, and they've got to make comparisons and they've got to make inferences from that data in terms of who's going to be the best in terms of for a calving ease, who's going to give us the most performance in the feedlot, who provides us uh, the highest quality cattle if we're going to sell them on a quality-based grid, those types of things. Now, I've got a number of references that I'm going to attach uh, that'll be here for your particular uses. We've got a NEB guide related to EPD basics and definitions, one on economic indexes, and then I've got also got a few other definitions I've collected and some sample sire summary quizzes. Uh, I'm going to bring those over here right now and just kind of give you a quick rundown on what these exist. Uh, the first one 
is EPD basics and definitions. This was put together by Dr. Matt Spangler. I think he did an excellent job with it. Don't worry too much if you go through this about the first couple of pages, okay? He gets into quite a bit on uh, some statistics and stuff like that, as you can see right up in this particular area. Don't worry about that. Come down into about the next page, about the third page, where he actually does a comparison between bull A and bull B for a whole host of different EPDs that are available, okay? And, he, and then down below, he actually describes using this comparative, these two comparative values, what exactly that means if we were to select one bull over another. That page is valuable. That page is extremely important. So pages three and four, the last two pages of this document would be good for your uh, youth to study. I would not concern yourself for our purpose in this contest uh, too much with what's on the first two pages. In addition, he's got an EPD on economic indexes for beef sire selection, okay? Again, he gives you definitions of what exactly they mean. Wean calf value, dollar wean. Cow energy value, it's actually measured in dollars of savings per cow per year, okay? Those number things would be good for your students to know and understand. Uh, and that's about three or four pages total. Uh, so I would suggest looking at that as well, okay? Um, in addition to, to help you, I've got another document that I use in some classes uh, that I've gathered from various breed associations, et cetera, that talk about the usage interpretation of genetic information, um, how they relate to individual data, to ratios that we talked about. Um, and then down below are a, is a listing of definitions for a whole host of EPDs. What exactly do they mean? What can we infer from those? So I would say hopefully that will be beneficial to you. Finally, for your practice and for uh, helping your students, I put together a set of five sample summary quizzes. They start off very simplistically with sire quiz number one. They get significantly more complex, incorporating different types of data as we get down into sire summaries four and five. But what I've done on this particular document for you is I've given you the table, and then I have basically provided 10 questions for you or your students to answer, given the definitions and what is provided. To help you, I've also provided you with the key and explanation. So you've got one page that you can hand to students, say go through this, answer who you would select, and then I will give you, you also have my key, and in italics over here, you can see I've got my explanations. And uh, there's Sire Summary Quiz 2. We come down a little bit farther. I've incorporated some indexes in, an index in that one. I've incorporated some uh, carcass-oriented EPDs in number two. We go down to number three. Uh, a couple of additional indexes. These are uh, a couple indexes that come from a different breed, not Angus. Uh, we've got birth weight and calving ease and maternal calving ease in this one. All three of those are directly related to dystocia, okay, which is the best indicator. Uh, in all reality, Calving ease, basically of his own offspring, is a far better indicator than just birth weight by itself. If you have both, the calving ease birth, the calving ease indicator is a better indicator of actual dystocia, the percentage of cows that are actually going to have to be assisted when they give birth to his offspring. Whenever you see this term maternal, it means we're going a generation away. We're talking about his off, uh, his offspring or his daughter's offspring, okay? Finally, we get down a little bit more. We go down into uh, actually number four here. Uh, one of these, I gotta find it. I believe I've got actual number, oh, I've gotta get down to number five, I'm sorry. So I scan down here to number five. Number five, this is an example where I gave them actual birth weight and a birth weight EP. Now, I didn't put calving ease in this one, but one of the question is, which sire would you expect to cause the most calving difficulties? A lot of people looking at this data are first gonna go right to actual birth weight, 101, holy cow, that's a cow killer, okay? 
that's going to be, that's the one that's going to have dystocia problems. In reality, when we take into account all the other factors associated with it, number two in this example actually has the highest birth weight EPD. Number two, on average, is the one that's going to have the higher birth weight. Number two is the one that's going to probably cause more calving difficulties on average. The birth weight EPD is more valuable than the actual birth weight because actual birth weight's one point in time. Birth weight EPD, it's his birth weight, it's his parents' birth weights, it's his grandparents' birth weights. If he has any siblings, it includes their birth weights. If he has any progeny, all of those go in. It's got so, so much more data incorporated to get that value and get us a true reflection of genetic merit. So hopefully those things will be valuable uh, to you. On the reproductive side, our objectives basically say that the student should be able to identify some basic reproductive organs and structures. And we're going to primarily focus it on the female side of the cow and specifically the non-female tract. We're not going to bring the pregnant tracts and talk about uh, have pregnancy in there. They ought to describe the importance of scrotal circumference. They should be able to discuss and outline demonstrate reproductive management practices related to estrus synchronization and artificial insemination. Uh, talk a little bit about a breeding soundness examination, maybe talk a little bit about the process of calving and providing some calving assistance. Uh, I've got a listing of basic reproductive equipment that they should be able to identify and tell us what we use it for. And there are some basic reproductive numbers. Uh, how long's the estrus cycle of the beef cow? What's the average gestation period of the beef cow? Those types of things. Okay. In terms of bovine female reproductive anatomy, we may actually lay out a tract for them, okay? Don't let that really uh, hinder them in any way. Relatively simple, we're not gonna ask for a lot of things, but they ought to be able to identify the cervix, okay? Uh, basically on the back end and down here towards the bottom where my highlighter is, that would be the back of the animal. Up here is gonna be the front of the animal, okay? Right in here is gonna be the cervix. Uh, over on this side, I've actually opened it. It's been opened up, and you can see it's got a ringular structure, okay? Uh, if they take a hold of it with their hand, we'll give them gloves, but when they take a hold of it in their hands, they're going to feel a muscular, uh, ringular type structure. A lot of people said it feels like a chicken neck. I think it feels kind of like a, a rubber hose that they can kind of feel and put around. They'll be able to identify it, just kind of know what they're looking for. That's the cervix. It's the gateway between the internal and external environment. It keeps the internal environment clean. It clamps down. It only opens up basically during the process of parturition. Okay? The uterine body is basically where the horns come together. Okay? And then we've got the horns on this side. The left side, we've got a horn. This side's been opened up, but this is also a horn. The calf will develop in one of those two horns depending upon where it ovulates from. And then I've got the ovary. Can't really see it real well in this picture, but that hump back there is the ovary, okay? Uh, closer up picture, here's the ovary. It's a almost the size of a golf ball, okay? Uh, and then I may ask them for what a couple structures are, okay? You see this little, a yellow body that's starting to appear. That's basically the remnants of a corpus luteum, CL. Over here is kind of a follicle. Long slender tubule that'll attach to the ovary and actually extends all the way to the uterine horn. That's called the oviduct. It's the fallopian tube that they may have heard of in biology. That is the primary site of fertilization. That is where fertilization occurs. That's where the sperm and the egg will actually meet. They ought to be able to identify some of those. So that's our corpus luteum. This is our follicle. This is the oviduct or the fallopian tube right through there. Okay, see that structure there that I've highlighted. Okay. So relative to the physiology, the follicles, they grow in response to a hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. FSH does exactly what the name says follicle stimulating hormone. It stimulates the hormone to grow. The follicles grow, excuse me, it stimulates the follicle to grow. The follicles grow and then they, as they grow, they secrete estrogen. Estrogen is important because it prepares the uterus 
for an eventual implantation of an embryo, okay? It also is responsible for secondary sex characteristics and estrous behavior. Makes sense. We've got a follicle that is growing, it's going to release an egg. If it releases that egg, the expectation is, is that will actually be fertilized and will start to grow and develop. Well, to facilitate the fertilization, we need to actually facilitate estrous behavior in that female animal. And we also need to have the uterus ready. The corpus luteum is the other structure that you might see on the ovary. It is known as a yellow body. And as you can see, there's a yellow body. This one's a little bit more mature, but the corpus luteum functions to secrete progesterone. Progesterone functions to maintain the pregnancy. It maintains the pregnancy by putting a block on this FSH. And that doesn't allow the follicles to grow anymore and they don't secrete any more estrogen and they don't cycle anymore. So follicles grow in response to FSH. They secrete estrogen, important for estrous behavior, preparing the uterus for implantation of an eventual embryo. Once the follicle has actually ovulated, we'll have corpus the corpus luteum comes in and it secretes progesterone and it maintains the pregnancy. Okay. Follicle stimulating hormone causes the follicle to grow. Um, and a primary application of it, it's actually a hormone that we might implement if we want to super ovulate a really good genetically superior heifer and we want to transfer some embryos to get her to super ovulate and ovulate more than one, we actually would exogenously administer some FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, in addition to a number of other things, but it is involved in that protocol. Estrogen secreted by the follicles, estrous behavior, okay, mating behavior. Luteinizing hormone, often re uh, referred to as LH, that causes ovulation of the egg. That's the actual hormone that actually causes the follicle to basically explode and release the egg. And then we got debris and the corpus luteum comes up. Okay. Progesterone is secreted by that corpus luteum. Okay, that follicle released an egg. And then you got some debris material. That debris material basically develops into, from the follicle, develops into the CL. And that CL secretes progesterone, which maintains the pregnancy because it keeps heat or estrus from recurring because the follicles aren't going to grow anymore. The application of this is it's a hormone that's commonly used with, many with an estrus synchronization protocol. You possibly have used or have seen people using cedars. Cedars are a vaginal implant that basically secrete progesterone and make the cow think that she's pregnant. Then when you, and when you, and if she thinks she's pregnant, she's not gonna come into heat. We remove the vaginal implant after a period of time and the level of progesterone drops and they all cycle and they all come into heat at the same time. Now, prostaglandin, that's a hormone secreted by the uterus due to atrophy of the egg. Egg was supposedly fertilized. It transferred, went down the oviduct, went into the uterus. It's supposed to divide and grow and develop. Well, if it doesn't, primarily because it wasn't fertilized, it's going to basically wither and atrophy away. Okay? The uterus basically says, wait a second. This isn't developing the way it was supposed to. It sends a hormonal signal that causes regression of the CL that was secreting progesterone, which was keeping heat from recurring, and says, let's regress that CL. We stop secreting progesterone. We need to restart the cycle. And so as that drops and progesterone drops, FSH starts to flow and we are cycling again, okay? Again, it's application, it's involved with some other estrous synchronization protocols. Uh, a product such as Lutalize is basically prostaglandin. You give an injection and they all will cycle within a reasonable time frame. Both of these hormones are directly involved 
with ester synchronization protocols. On the mail side of things, I'm not going to ask them to identify any particular items on the track, but I think they should know a little bit about a breeding soundness examination. There's basically four components. It's an external body evaluation. Is the animal healthy? An external reproductive organ evaluation, a scrotal circumference. They should be able to know how to take a scrotal circumference and what do those numbers mean. Internal reproductive tract evaluation. They won't have to do that, but the vet would actually go in and palpate the internal reproductive organs you feel in for abnormalities. And finally, an evaluation of semen mold, evaluation for motility and morphology. Motility, how active they are. Morphology, what percentage of the spermatozoa are normal versus abnormal? We make the assumption that the abnormals are probably infertile. Those are the four components of a breeding soundness examination. Now in terms of possible skill activities that we may ask them to do, artificial insemination, actually demonstrate the proper, we're, they're not gonna do AI, but we may ask them to demonstrate how to properly load an AI pipette. Um, and then if they got that loaded, we may ask them to, on a tract, show us how to thread that through the cervix and exactly where that semen should be deposited. When training your students, tell them that the semen needs to be deposited just on the anterior side, just on the front side of the cervix. The reason that we wanna be on the front of the cervix, towards the head of the cow, but we don't wanna get into the uterine horns because we don't know from which side she's gonna ovulate. So they gotta stop in the uterine body, okay? Um, and I've got a, a couple of examples. Scrotal circumference, they should be able to demonstrate how to properly measure the scrotal circumference on a bull. And then we also got, from a calving assistant standpoint, they should be able to demonstrate how to properly apply a set of obstetrical chains, okay? And so for each of these three, I've actually have identified some YouTube videos uh, that would help. I think they're fairly, fairly good in terms of describing what they need, and so, those will be provided as some references as well. So uh, this one actually comes from an industry side of things, but it basically describes how to do different things. And most of these are in the neighborhood of about three, in, three minutes long, okay? Same thing with scrotal circumference. It's about four minutes long. Uh, and then how to place a set of obstetric chains and this individual does a really good job of actually describing how to apply a set of obstetrical chains. And I will give you those particular links. So, those will be available to you, uh, and hopefully that will help you in terms of preparing uh, your students. Uh, here's simply a list of uh, equipment that's related to reproduction that your students ought to be able to identify, tell us a little bit about what they are and where they're from, uh, or what they do. And then uh, the finally, if we're talking about beef cattle management and reproduction, they ought to know some very basic numbers. Uh, how long is the, uh, at what age do animals come into puberty? Uh, in terms of beef cattle, boss taurus, anywhere from eight to 15 months of age. Estrus cycle length, basically from heat to heat, estrus to estrus, ovulation to ovulation, will average 21 days. The duration of estrus is about 18 hours for a boss taurus animal. The timing of ovulation, that's important if we're actually utilizing artificial insemination. They actually ovulate the egg on average about 12 to 14 hours after the end of estrus. Um, there used to be an old rule with artificial insemination called an AMPM rule. If you saw them in heat in the morning, inseminate them that uh, in the evening. If you saw them in heat in the evening, wait till next, tomorrow morning to inseminate. The premise of that particular rule or rule of thumb or guideline is the fact that the cow ovulates about 12 to 14 hours after she has exhibited estrus. 
and estrus is the time when she's actually receptive to mating, natural mating, and showing estrus behavior. If bred, the gestation length on average is about 285 days. And that's important because if I want to maintain a 365 day calving interval, have one calf every 365 days, I have exactly no more than 80 days to get them bred, rebred from the time they calf. 80 days, and that's not very long. Especially given that they typically won't come back into estrus for 30 to 60 days, depending upon body condition, and after they've calved. That's referred to as the postpartum interval. So those are just a few key numbers reproductively that your students should understand. Um, relative to reproductive management, the again, I got a couple of extension publications uh, here that I will post uh, and make available for review as well. I uh, vast majority of these are not ex uh, extremely long. The synchronizing estrus one, uh, that one does get pretty detailed in terms of protocols. I'm not concerned about students knowing specific protocols. There's a plethora of protocols available. I simply want them to understand the basics of how we're synchronizing estrus. We're using progesterone to make them think they're pregnant. We release the, pre release the progesterone and they start to cycle. Or we give them a shot of prostaglandin that basically regresses the CL so that everything grows or the follicles grow and they start to cycle again. The basics. I don't want them to identify specific protocols. Um, So that gives, provides good. This one here on bull management nutrition, I would focus on a couple of pages to talk about the breeding soundness examination. Talks a little bit about motility, morphology of semen, stuff like that. There's a couple pages strictly related to BSEs and breeding soundness examinations. So um, I appreciate that. I apologize for the fact that we didn't get the original one recorded, but hopefully this has been beneficial to you. And I thank you very much for your time and wish you all the best of luck with the CDE management contest. Thank you.